Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Breath of Fire 2. Last episode, we went to Sten's hometown, the Fortress of Highland, in order to get a Master's Flute so that we could get the Therapy Pillow, so that we can enter Gandalf the Elder Tree's dreams, so we can figure out what the heck is going on with the forest at gate. I know, it's a lot. And Sten has had some interpersonal problems throughout the midst of this, because he used to be the commander of an army, but he faked his own death at Goofheim, and then ran away from his past. Until now, where he's had to deal with everyone he left behind. Now he's in the process of rescuing the princess, has fallen down a pit while attempting to do so, and... Now he's reunited with us, so we can conclude our journey. Make sure that you have an empty accessory slot as you go through here. You'll get higher preemptives that way, and... Joining us today is... Nobody. Because unfortunately, I lost my original audio for this, and... Well, I'm not gonna make Skyzo pay for my mess up, so... This one is going to be a solo episode, and yeah, that invisible pathway I walked on there, I don't know why it's there, it's not useful, I just thought it was funny. In any case, we've got the larva crawlers who have a boatload of HP and can also use poison breath on you, but fortunately they are also weak to fire, so use a fire spice and fire blast, and there you go. They are down for the count. And honestly, that kind of sums up most of the fights here, with the exception of the two Basilisk fight, which can be a little scary if you didn't equip yourself with all the extra armor and stuff from the some of the other bonus episodes. But that's why we bought three Ammonias beforehand. And yeah, here's another Deathbringer. He's not so scary now, because Lean and Sten outspeed him, so no instant death for us. But yeah, rule number one of any kind of collaborative project, never make someone else pay for your own mistakes. I didn't want to drag Skyzo back in for something that was my doing, because it basically mean he can put work in and just have it come to nothing. And we now have the Pharaoh Mage. Same story as the Deathbringer, except this time I want to use only one Fire Spice since I only have a limited supply of them, and then beat up the Pharaoh Mage with a melee from Sten. And the Soul Flicker can just be one hit KO'd with Ryu's Saw Blade, which is why I re-equipped that before attacking. Not that I really needed to, it just ha it can just drain your HP and AP and all that. It has a really weak physical attack too, so not a threat, but... Well, I just felt like it. Also, Ryu's Whelps are not going to be useful here, because the next boss absorbs elemental damage and the boss after takes halved damage, so we're free to use it as we please. Also, I'm going to edit out the initiatives later on, but for now I just wanted to show you just how much easier the empty accessory slot glitch makes things. So make sure to keep Ryu's accessories open. Oh boy, two Basilisks. Okay, so these guys have a 75% chance of attacking twice, and can also cast the Defense Down spell on you, so if you get unlucky, they can actually kill someone. So what I want to do is have Lean and Sten use their fire spells, while Ryu and Rand target one or the other, and that should be enough to bring them down, because they're not terribly bulky enemies, just they hit kind of hard. Unless, of course, you bought the Iron Braces, like I said, then, then they're easy. And just as a reminder, the Iron Braces are what you get from a township tenant called Hans. You need to th recruit three other tenants first, and then expand Township by paying the Carpenter a thousand zenny. 
And then you'll find Hans in a house at Township. And then you can buy the Iron Braces for free from him and boost everyone's defense up by like 20 points apiece if you have two on. Alternatively, you could also fish a Monero near Melodia, but that requires a third coin and you're only guaranteed two, so... Alright, now we're past the first part of the dungeon and... Oh, hey! Trubo's not doing so hot, is he? Guess he should have used that healing spring before charging off into battle. I mean, we did knock him around pretty hard last episode. Or maybe it's just because he tried to solo the magic gate boss coming up next. Oof. Ouch. So is there like a reason that guy couldn't have helped us out with the boss? Just have a fifth party member? Just saying. Well, at any rate, let's shuffle around our gear for a minute. Make sure Lean has 60 defense, so she takes high formula damage rather than medium, and... Okay, password. Klaatu Barata Nick... Okay, I think that's about right. Did I get it? I think so. It's looking good. Oh, come on! I mean, I, I said the words, right? Well, whatever. Here's the next boss. Alright, so, the magic gate. Basically, it just deals melee attacks almost the whole way. Relatively hard ones, so we don't want to use a scatter formation, but we do want to use a normal formation to get it down as soon as we can. Because if it goes on too long, there's a small chance of him using something called the Typhoon, which is a wind spell that hits everyone for like 80 to 100 damage or something stupidly high. And it can also use Fire Breath, like the Terrapin, which also does AoE damage. Now, we took precautions before heading into this fight. We have one Hard Tack, or a Biscuit, which heals everyone and multiplies their defense by 1.2 times. And we've also been saving up all our Vitalizers, which restore 120 HP to everyone. We have three of those kinds of items between the hard tacks and vitalizers, so we should be good, but still, you can never be too careful, even if the Typhoon's only like a 3% chance of occurring. And also, you don't absolutely need them, it's just... Otherwise, without him, you'd have to approach this fight like the Terrapin fight, where you just have everyone healing with vitamins all the time. And you'd have to let some folks die, because not everyone can outspeed, so only Lean and Sten would be guaranteed to survive. Oh, here it is! Ouch. Oh well. Like I said, make sure you have your AoE healing items if you don't have a heart attack going into this. Well, you wouldn't be able to get any since you're kind of locked in Highland until the arc is over, but... Anytime before that, you could buy four Thunder Rods from Goons and just cook them with the Carpenter. Very easy, just... Make sure you save first before attempting it, because there is that small chance that you'll get some charcoals instead of hard tacks. And on a final note, if you're gonna use Nina for this fight, you may consider teaching her Slice or Chop Chop from the Wildcat, as she's otherwise gonna be pretty useless here. And there we go, done and dusted. Pretty easy fight, especially since he doesn't usually use his spells. Consult your operating manual for further details. Nice one, Ryusui. And look! Turvo's getting back on his feet! 
Of course, in real life, when you knock someone out, it usually only lasts for a few moments. Any longer than that, and you've given them brain damage, more than likely. Then again, maybe it was a few moments in real time, and the door just got busted down real quick. That, or maybe Highlanders are just a different breed than humans. No, actually, he only has 120 HP. He, he can't be that strong if two fire blasts are all it takes to knock him out. So, I don't know, what the heck. Oh, make sure you get Sten in the front or whoever is wearing the holy scarf. Like I said, it's a permanent smoke bomb, but only if the guy wearing it is in front of the marching order. Not in slot one. In front of the marching order. I guess because if you have a repellent, it's only going to be at max efficacy if the guy in front of the party is wearing it. Otherwise, like, the repellent is overpowered by the human smell, I don't know. Anyways, make sure you equip the saw blade before coming in, and the holy knife, or silver knife, to Sten. This next boss is weak to holy. Not only that, but Ryu and Sten can attack her completely without repercussion. Which is part of the reason why it's... Well, you'll see. Also, there was another item we could have picked up called the Collar or Bell Torque, which doubles the random encounter rate instead. Only Lean can equip it, though. And if you have that and the Holy Scarf on at the same time, priority goes to whatever is in the first accessory slot. Now, see, here's a question. If the weapon is coming from the princess's energy and emotion, What's stopping the princess from just turning it on Spooke, or just not using it? Or, heck, she could just train herself to be stoic and all that, and then you're kind of stuck. I mean, the princess has had military training, right? She leads a nation of mercenaries, so I imagine she has to. Or maybe it's one of those machines that just, like, sap your emotion against your will? I don't know. I guess the more pressing question is how they have machines that are powered by your emotions and soul, and yet they still have hand-operated elevators. Alright, Spooke. The main thing to know about this one is that she goes by a completely fixed attack pattern. Completely fixed. You can predict each and every single thing she does apart from turn 2 if she's below 50% HP, and turn 3 if she's above 50% HP. So basically, if you just do enough damage to her quick enough, you can just leapfrog past everything that's actually threatening, and just kill her before she can do anything. And yeah, she can do a move that restores all status ailments, and all of that, but her natural wisdom is so high that you never want to bother with it anyway, so for us, it's effectively just a free turn. And yeah, I'm playing around with her a little just to show that she can use the death spell, but even then, it's not really relevant because Rand has the wake command, which works more than 50% of the time, and we've got literally three free turns to wake her up with, so even with an instant death spell, she's still not threatening. Not only that, but her AI is bugged. She's supposed to have a 50% chance of countering all melee attacks, but for some reason the programmers messed things up so that it looks at a character's animation data rather than the random number generator it's supposed to use. So. If Ryu or Sten attacks her, or basically anyone else besides Rand or Lean, she just never counters you. Never. And yeah, if we're really just doing whatever we can to break the game, we basically just wait on turn 1 and then spam T-Dragon for turns 2 and 3 and she drops dead instantly. 
She doesn't even have a chance of draining any of Ryu's AP because she always targets the person with the most AP, which is Deese. And even if she could target Ryu, we're using Wisdom Seeds and his AP is low enough that you could probably just kill her on the second turn anyway, so... This is one of the most pathetically easy boss fights in the entire game. It's... It's almost comical. Which is a bummer, cause... She's one of the best villains in the game from a story perspective. Also, this flying fortress... It might actually be a reference to Breath of Fire 1, because in that game, one of the endgame dungeons is a flying fortress called Obelisk. And that's what housed Myria, the goddess of lies, after she was awakened by basically the main villain of that game, Jade or Judas. He reawakened it in the hopes of conquering the world with it. Even some other similarities, too, like, it's in a really high-up place, in the middle of a desert region, just like Highland itself is. So, not sure if that was intentional, but either way, there are some neat parallels being drawn between the first and second game here. In other news, I also like the one of the following text boxes coming up here. here. One of Ryu Sui's uh, sillier lines, I think. Damn it to hell! Which one of these damn buttons turns this damn thing off? Stop, damn you! <laughs> like, he just says damn four different times in the same text box. It kind of reminds me of that one scene from Shadow the Hedgehog. You know, where's that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? And in case you're curious, that particular line is a case of punching up by Ryusui. I asked him about it on Twitter, and the original text was just Turbo telling the machine to stop in several different ways, but I guess he's a fiery enough personality that... Well, it was in character for him. I still would have varied it up a bit, though, if I were the one doing the translation. But yeah, back to Spooky, it really is a shame that she's gone. This game's kinda got the Batman Beyond problem of having all these interesting villains that have possibilities, but they all keep dying at the end of every episode, which was cool for the first few ones, but it made the show a lot more episodic than it needed to be. And ah, uh, there's the reason for the hand-operated elevators. Someone is gonna have to die. But what about our gear? Our holy scarf? Our silver knife? Our speed suit? Am I just gonna lose that all when he dies? I hate it when RPGs do that. It's like with Final Fantasy IV. You never knew when a character was gonna die, and the equipment would just go down with them. So you just had to know when to unequip them. That was annoying. Although I guess the more pressing issue is how Sten is able to carry Ryu, Bosch, Lean, Rand, Tapeta, Aspara, and Nina, and two monkey men. All on the same elevator, with just one hand. I mean, that is some impressive strength right there. Makes it all the more shameful that he's apparently going to die. Well, actually, you know what? No, he isn't. He's not. I'm not sure whether it's good writing or not. I still like it, though. Like, none of the characters buy that Sten is actually dead. Like, they're not trying to play it up for drama, they're just like, yeah, he's probably fine, he's... he'll be back. If Goofheim couldn't kill him, nothing can. It does kind of deflate the tension, but... I also do find it charming that, like, everyone who actually knows him knows that he's probably just faking it. It's a nice character moment, if nothing else. 
Also, yeah, we got the Master's Flute, if you were reading the past couple of text boxes there. It's kind of easy to forget just why we're here in the first place, as it is with a lot of moments in the game, but... We got what we were looking for all the same. We're just down a party member, or so the game would have us believe. I guess that's part of the reason why the save statue here doesn't have all the functionalities it normally has. If you're able to choose change party, Stan might just be right there. Who knows? Just in the hypothetical scenario that Stan is alive. Yeah, that's real life, and interesting how that works out. Although, a lot of that is also it probably being a numbers game, where you have your nice guy and your not-so-nice guy, and the nice guy only goes after the ladies that he likes, whereas the not-so-nice guy just hits on anything with a skirt, so you keep at it for long enough and eventually he's gonna score someone. Oh, yep. Just like he always is, Sten's faking his death and then moving on from his home. Part of his character, I guess. But yeah, it's hard to say whether it would have been better with Sten's death or it being like it is now. Skyzo thought that his death would have served the plot better, just because we haven't seen anyone important die in the plot thus far, so this would have been a powerful moment and turning point in our quest, but he still thought it was the peak regardless. Skills honed like hunting knives. That was actually a line from the old translation, too. It was mostly bad, but it did have gems of brilliance like that, and Ryusui was nice enough to include all of them in his translation, so good on him for that. Oh, down he goes, I guess. Falling from infinite heights is just a thing Turbo does. Although granted, there's water underneath, so... Actually, I wonder... I wonder what terminal velocity is for hitting water, because I think if you fall from a certain height, landing in water will still kill you. Unless your toes are pointed or something like that, and... You know, you're covering your groin? I think I read that in a worst-case scenario book once, where having your toes pointed would just allow for a smoother entry into water than if you just fell flat on your back. I don't know, though. Anyways, we're gonna head back to Melodia, now that we have our Master's Flute. And that will allow us to talk to the land of music people. You know, the ones that can only communicate via music, which is a thing in real life, but still has to be ridiculously inconvenient for foreign policy and all that. Honestly, you'd think they'd at least have an interpreter or something. And again, they are a stranded island, so maybe they're just isolationist, period. Anyways, that would be all for this episode. Sorry that Skyzo wasn't around to, uh add some flavor to everything, but it is what it is. He will be back once we start the Melodia episode, which is the very next one after I upload the bonus episode, because as it turns out, Highland is not nearly as easy as it was for me if you don't have a properly leveled Sten, and I want to show you exactly how mean the game is to unprepared players. So that's the next bonus episode, but in any case, have a nice day everyone, and God bless you all.